and suffering and death and misery that we see so rampant in the world around us, a world that is ready uh, to explode into nuclear war at any minute. And we pray, Father, at this time for the success and protection and blessing for your work, that you grant your servant Israel the means and the ability to get this message out to the dying world, Father, so that the two billion can be called uh, who will be left alive uh, uh, at the end of this destruction and to become a part of your house and work, Father, in proving themselves uh, worthy. And we ask and pray that you bless our minds of understanding as we rehearse the words of your servant Israel, which are your words, Father, and that you help us to, to hold on to these words, to put them to full use in our life so that we may qualify to be a part of your family. And we give you the thanks and praise for all these things in the name of our, your high, our high priest and your son, Yahshua. Hallelujah, Yahweh. Praise Yahweh. You may be seated, men. Before we begin, I just want to let you know we are covering tonight the December 2010 uh, Prophetic Word magazine. Uh, this will conclude uh, the uh, 2010 yearbook, which is about to be released. And I just want to announce that uh, next week, we will be starting uh, on the book, Did Yahshua Messiah Pre-Exist? So you have a week to go ahead and uh, resurrect your copy from wherever you buried it. <laughs> and... Uh, and uh, start going over that. There's so many interesting things in, in the history of uh, the 12 tribes and, and how they uh, counterfeited and came against Yahweh's work and created their own religion that rules the world at this time, rules the kings of the world. Uh, all nations controlled, even the ones that you think are bitter enemies, if you could really see behind the scenes, you would see how the Vatican is uh, controlling each of the nations here. And we're going to get in depth into their teachings and into the lies that they brought forth and, and how they uh, took away Yahweh's name and his laws away from the minds of the people. You know, and when you see this, you'll see what a brilliant uh, creature that we're up against here in Satan and how she was able to do this so crafty and so subtle. Uh, they said, you know, as the prophet said, there's nothing that was hidden from her. And she used every bit of it and all the wisdom that Yahweh blessed her with in order to try to destroy mankind by seducing them into thinking that they would have all the blessings that they could ever desire if they would only follow her. The truth of the matter is, and we're bringing this to the world at this time, is that the only way to have those blessings and have the joy and abundant life is by following Father Yahweh. He is the only one that has life and blessings to give. Satan has nothing but false promises uh, and false hope and an intention of murder, killing all, all mankind, is her goal. So don't fall for these uh, tricks. Believe, as Yahshua said, believe the prophecies. And that's what we're going to go into today as the cover shows Yahweh's last day's prophesied work revealed by the two witnesses. We're going to see the reason for mankind. We're going to see prophecies that were never before understood by anyone and finally, we're going to see tonight what is the uh, scepter of righteousness here that was uh, spoken of by the prophets. And Pastor starts out, he says, My dear friends, please read the following paragraphs. And we're going to read this here. It says, Cyrus came from the east, Isaiah 41, 2, but defeated a number of kingdoms north of Babylon early in his reign. Palestinian authors frequently perceived invasions as coming primarily from the north. This is the first of the famous prophecies concerning the great future, in quote, servant of the Lord. They put Lord there, but it, they, they know it's Yahweh. The great future servant of Yahweh. Interpreter, uh, interpreters have struggled 
with the question, who is meant by the servant? Now, they struggle with this because they do not know Yahweh. They do not know his laws or they refuse them. And so they don't have the understanding. And then they reject the, the, the one who could give them the understanding. Some think that the servant of the Lord is the people of Israel. Others think it makes reference to the faithful part of the people, the, quote, ideal people of Israel. Still others think of the prophets as a group. Another large group of scholars believes that the servant of the Lord is the Messiah, the one who will establish the kingdom on earth. All right, so this servant of Yahweh, they call him the Lord. We're going to see more on this as we proceed in this issue. But this is the, these scholars have no clue, okay? The scholar is referring to the scriptures that prophesy the Savior Yahshua's work in what is called the last days. Yes, the Savior, although he was resurrected and ascended to the right hand of Yahweh, he has a work in these last days, the, which is the coming of two brothers whom Yahweh sends and calls them his witnesses, who are being directed by Yahshua, who now sits at the right hand of Yahweh as high priest over the last day's house of Yahweh. This work is being directed. It's the work. There are many such prophecies concerning this work and the director, high priest, and king, Yahshua Messiah, whose name was removed by the translators along with the name of the creator, Yahweh. More information concerning the removal and replacement of their names will be written in later chapters, but can be obtained in other books at this time by request. Now, Isaiah 41.2 is a later prophecy of the Savior Yahshua and the last day's work of Yahweh that is in progress now. A message of warning is going out to all nations at this time. But let us deal with this inspired prophecy first. Then we, we will proceed to the many other scriptures concerning the last day's warning to all nations and the two brothers who were sent by Yahshua, the high priest over the last day's prophesied work of Yahweh, all done by the authority or name of Yahweh. So it had to be authorized. It had to be prophesied in advance, but let's look at these prophecies closely. All right, in the first one here, it's Isaiah 41, 25. Now, in the King James Version, it reads, I have raised up one from the north. He shall come from the rising of the sun, shall he call upon my name. And he shall come upon princes as upon mortar, and as the potter treadeth clay. The very first prophecy in this verse is speaking of a man in the north being raised up or rather stirred up or inspired to come to another place in the west to do a work. The Hebrew word translated raised is the in the English translation is ur, the Hebrew word ur and means, first of all, rousing or inspiring someone to action for a work that is to be done. The following insert is from the Hebrew Dictionary of Strong's Exhaustive Concordance, and that's what it shows here. Rousing someone in action, to action. All right, raising someone means rousing them to action, stirring their mind to carry out a certain job, according to the instructions given. I will tell you who this man was later. But let's notice another man who is actually the first one, because there are three different men spoken of in Isaiah chapter 41. So we're going to read verse 2 here from the book of Yahweh. Who raised up the righteous one from the east, calling him to his feet, 
gave him the nations before him and made him rule over kings, who gave them as the dust to his sword, as wind-blown uh, stubble to his bow, or bow, to his bow, <laughs> excuse me. Since many people use the King James Version, let's look at it. In Isaiah uh, 41, 2, it says, Who raised up the righteous man from the east, called him to his foot, and gave the nations before him, and made him rule over kings? He gave them as the dust to his sword, and as driven stubble to his bow. The Hebrew word translated raised in this verse is the same Hebrew word in Isaiah 41, 25. But it carries a slightly different meaning because of the context in which it is used. Notice this same Hebrew word also means raised from the dead. And the copy is shown there, out of the sleep of death. Okay, in reference to Eob, uh, or Job 14, 12. So man lieth down and riseth not. That's talking about death. There's no other time unless you're talking about someone who's <laughs> extremely lazy in a couch potato who lieth down and riseth not. But even the most laziest of people are going to get up at some point to, to get some food or run to the refrigerator or the restroom or something. They won't just lay there and not get up. So we know he's talking about raising someone from the dead. So man lieth down and riseth not, till the heavens be no more. They shall not awake, nor be raised out of their sleep. This should not be too hard to understand. There has only been one totally righteous man. Remember Isaiah 41, 2 speaks of who raised up the righteous one. All right, totally righteous, living completely without sin. There's only been one who lived completely without sin, who died and then was raised up from the dead. The same prophet who was inspired to write uh, Isaiah 41 was also inspired to write Isaiah 53 concerning the same righteous man. He says he was cut off from the land of the living. All right, it talks about how he was oppressed, how he was tortured, afflicted, Yet he not opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. He was cut off from the land of the living. Now, don't think I'm wrong and stop reading or listening. You will see, if you read on, that these three prophecies are only a very few of the many that start in Genesis and travel all the way through to Revelation that have never been before understood by anyone. You can see we had it right here in that commentary on page one. Interpreters have struggled with the question. They struggle and they err, as Yahshua said, because they know not the Scriptures. Yes, many people will quote you Scriptures. Many people will say, well, I'm, from, I'm sent by Yahweh. But they don't know how to add up the truth in the Scriptures and explain these things and explain the prophecies. They can't show you where they're prophesied. They can't show you what the prophets said about salvation and how and where you should get it. So these, and there's a reason for it. Yahweh sealed it. In the book of Daniel, in Daniel 12, it says Daniel was told that the book that is the understanding of what was written here, the understanding of these prophecies would be sealed until the time of the end. Well, that explains why these interpreters and so-called scholars, you know, are struggling to understand, well, what does this verse mean? They claim to follow the Bible, but they cannot tell you what it means. And there's uh, um, whole classes or sermons that, that were given why that is, why these interpreters can't understand these simple things. But get in your mind, and if you'll read Isaiah 53, 1 through 12, 
you'll see more details about Yahshua Messiah because he was prophesied of by the prophets of old. Remember, Yahweh would have no work, no work, no salvation offered, no work that's building to his kingdom that's not prophesied in advance. And at any given time, there was only one work of Yahweh, one house of Yahweh in operation. All right, there, there was only one that was taking place. It wasn't scattered about, or it was this little group here, but, and they didn't know about this little group over here. And wow, look at these people over here. They're worshiping Yahweh too. Well, wait a minute. They're doing things just a little bit differently. How can we all be worshiping Yahweh if everyone does a little bit differently? Well, the answer is they can't. They're not worshiping Yahweh because they're all interpreting it themselves and they all leave out one or more of Yahweh's laws uh, unless they're the prophesied work. Because only the prophesied work is shown to be able to be the recipient of the opening of these seals because it was opened in the last days. The understanding was opened. It was opened by who? Yahshua Messiah, who sent it by the Moloch to his servant. Remember in, Re in the beginning of Revelation there? It was open, but it was only given to the Moloch of the congregation of the house of Yahweh at Philadelphia. No, it's not Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. <laughs> it's, not, it's the brotherly love. It's the associates of the brother from the womb. The seventh era, the last lamp on the lampstand are the only ones that this was sent to. All right, but if you look back to Isaiah 41, 2, and remember, the word raised here means raised from the dead. He was raised from the dead and called him to his feet. The word translated foot in the, now in, in uh, the King James is the word regal and is translated feet 216 times and should have been rendered as such, called him to his feet. The King James says foot. He wasn't one-legged or anything. It should have been translated feet. All right? And, uh, but it's talking about uh, standing up, raising him from the dead. Okay? And it's the, he's the only man that lived completely without sin who died and was resurrected from the dead. And he died in accordance to the prophecies. And there's many prophecies starting way back in Genesis that shows that how he would die and, and the manner in which he would die and so forth and how uh, the specifics of it, even down to the fact that none of his bones would be broken and so forth and the blood drained from his body uh, by a spear as it was and then when he would be put in the grave, how long he would be in the grave and so forth, Okay. Uh, and we see then that because he never committed sin, in Yachanan 5 here, he says, For the Father does not judge any man, but has committed all judgment to the Son, and has given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. All right, he wasn't an angel. He wasn't a Moloch. He wasn't some sort of spirit being that floated around in the desert near Moshe. He wasn't even alive at that time. He was a son of man, not a half alien, half human. There's no such thing. You know, that, that is false. Yahweh would never allow that. Uh, and so all these theories that they have, about this, you know, they, you'll hear it, they'll talk about this angel of the Lord, as the King James writes it. It was not Yahshua Messiah. He was a son of man. He says, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who has sent me. How did he know Yahweh sent him? 
because he woke up one night and there in his closet was standing Yahweh, or maybe under the bed, <laughs> and a voice was telling him, hey, I'm Yahweh, I'm sending you out. Now, I think I heard the answer already. It's through prophecy. Well, Isaiah 53, 1 through 12, is just one of the many prophecies of Yahshua and the work he would do. For your studies, if you would read in, in Yachanan 5, from 22 through 47, we don't have time to read every verse, but you'll see uh, these prophecies and what yeah, the work that Yahshua was assigned. Now remember, Yahweh raised a righteous man to his feet and gave him judgment of the nations and had... Uh, had been accepted as the heir of all things. All right? This was the, the work that was done to bring forth Yahshua, who li would live a perfectly sinless life, who would die, and he, he would be the only one, because he never sinned, who would be able to lay his life down as payment for all of us, because every one of us, every last one of us, other than him, has committed sin in our life, and we could not lay our own life down. We already used it up. We had no more life to give. We'd, we'd burned it up. But he alone could pay that for us, and he did. Well, the, the Hebrew writer here in Hebrews, the book of Hebrew, then shows how our forefathers went astray in the wilderness by not believing the one sent by Yahweh. All right, there, and this goes back to the, uh, the work of Yahweh. There is always, always one who is sent to lead that work and to teach the people salvation. They cannot understand it. We cannot understand it without that. That's why we know that Zechariah was true when he said, for before those days, before the days of the two witnesses in these last days, and, and from the time the work was killed out, there was no salvation, because there was no one to preach it. Yes, they could read it, but as the Ethiopian man plainly said, sure, I can read this, and he sat there reading it. He pulled his chariot over at a rest stop or something, and he sat there reading the Scriptures, but he said, and, and, and Philip rightly said, well, do you understand what you're reading? And that is a valid question to anyone who claims, well, I read my Bible. A lot of people say they read the Bible every day. Well, that's great. I think they would do better reading the phone book. They'd get more use out of it because they cannot understand it if they reject the teacher. And as the Ethiopian said, how can I unless someone guides me. Well, who's that guide? You know, is it the guy that claims, uh, anybody that comes along and claims he's the guide and he can teach you? No, you've got to find him in prophecy. That's the only way you'll know. And as Hebrews 3 and 4 show, this disobedience to the one Yahweh sent who is plainly identified in prophecy, number one, Yahweh has uh, arranged it and has never failed that only His work would be called by the name House of Yahweh. And then you look at every other thing that's going on that that person does, and lo and behold, it's all done according to the instructions given by the prophets that would identify it as that work of Yahweh. And it's never failed. Okay? It's never failed. Now, in, but we see there, because of their disobedience, then their unbelief, all right? First, you've got to believe all the prophets have spoken. Then you've got to obey it. Because remember, the demons believe and tremble. They know what's coming. Satan knows what's coming. You know, she, I know she's deceived herself on some level, but really she knows what's coming, and she knows what her end will be, and she's hoping to thwart her end but, and not have 
mankind be that family of Yahweh, that immediate family, by destroying mankind. Okay, so it, it takes uh, obedience, it takes belief and obedience. Or as the Apostle Jacob said, faith without works is dead. All right, dead. So if it's a faith only, or only believe, and that's right out of the King James, okay? Faith without works is dead. Now, how you get around being dead, you know, there's not anybody going to resurrect you if you're not going to uh, abide by Yahweh's laws, which are doing the works. There'll be no, you'll, you'll suffer the second death and never live again. So that should be plain to anyone. But the prophets, and especially Daniel, Daniel in uh, uh, chapter 9, if you'll mark that and read 1 through 13, shows uh, many statements there that, uh, that our forefathers, some of our forefathers did not worship Yahweh, did not keep His laws, or call upon Yahweh's name. Therefore, they had no understanding of prophecy. All right? Their prayers were not directed to Yahweh. So to whom were they directed? They were directed to the same being as they are today. Notice Jeremiah 23, 27. And these are uh, prophets, so-called prophets, who devise, plan, and scheme and cause my people to forget my name, they'll tell you, what does it matter what we call them? Why don't we call them Yahweh God so everybody knows? But everybody's worshiping Yahweh in their heart, you know? But notice, which they tell every man to his neighbor, just as their fathers have forgotten my name for Baal, Lord. And that's who they pray to. Lord God, and we have a booklet, Who is Lord God, that'll open your eyes and your mind to the complete understanding of that. Well, these same ones did this in Jerusalem and took over and they, they turned, they, they uh, uh, taught these lies. It says, they commit adultery and walk in lies. They strengthen the hands of the evildoers so that no one turns back from his wickedness. Pastor brought out a, a great, great uh, scripture in Acts 3 this last week. Now concerning Yahshua, because this is, remember, there's three men we're speaking of here. We're still talking about the first one here, Yahshua, who's guiding and directing the work that came after him. Because remember, he told the apostles, well, I have to go to my Father. You continue in this what I've assigned you. You're going to die, he told them. And then many years after that, in the last days, there's going to be one final work. Actually, uh, two. One's going to die out. But then the, that last work, that last lamp, is what he was most concerned about because that would complete the plan. The sixth work didn't uh, anywhere near come to completing the plan of Yahweh. Not till the seventh. So it says, To you first, Yahweh having raised up, now remember Isaiah 41 two, raised up His Son, Yahshua, sent Him to bless you, and turning every one of you away from His iniquities, preaching against sin which is the same as preaching the laws of Yahweh. Many claim to, to, to preach the laws of Yahweh, but they don't turn the people away from their iniquities. Like he said so that in, in Uremia, so that no one turns back from his wickedness. All of them are like Sodom to me. Notice that. All. Remember Revelation 12, 9, the whole world is deceived. All of them are like Sodom to me and her inhabitants like a Gomorrah. Now, a true prophet here 
would do the opposite of what Yeremia is saying here and turn the people back from their wickedness. Or as Acts 3.26 says, uh, to bless you in turning every one of you away from his iniquities. But if you'll notice, these false preachers that leave the house of Yahweh and try to go out on their own and go down the road one way or the other, uh, they... Uh, they don't turn the people from their sins as they say, oh, that doesn't work. You can't condemn their sins or they'd run off. Well, if they run off because you're condemning their sins, then they simply don't want to repent. Who would you be uh, more afraid of pleasing or not ple displeasing, Yahweh or man? Yahweh. And that's one characteristic of Israel Hawkins. He has never shied away from telling us the truth about sin and righteousness. No matter who we were, where we came from, who we thought we were, or anything. He's never shied away from that. Now look at in Lamentations 2.14. He says, Your prophets saw visions for you that were false and deceptive. So notice, you're going to have many prophets... Or as uh, the apostle wrote, there'll be many false prophets in that day. They don't call themselves false. They say, oh, they're, they're sent by Yahweh. They're, they're doing the work of Yahweh. All right? And, and they're going to have visions that were false and deceptive. You know how you know that they're false and deceptive? Look at the next sentence. They did not expose your iniquity. Not telling us our sins is, is harmful. They actually bring harm to the people. They, and, and they did not expose your iniquity to notice, to ward off your captivity. Now, he's just not talking about being dragged off in body. He's being talking about the captivity of being owned by Satan. Because if you commit sin, you belong to the devil, right? First Yachinon 3, 7 and 8. Romans 6, 16. So you're captive. But not exposing your iniquity to ward off your captivity, but have envisioned for you false promises of hope and deception. Well, what is that false promise? Don't worry. You can do that and you'll be in the kingdom. You don't have to keep that law. Tithing was only for farmers. Because farmers don't work. They just throw seeds on the ground and it grows. And somebody else comes along, picks them out there, puts them in bushels and puts them in your barn. So they don't have to do any work at all. And I'm, I'm not making that up. That was said to me one time. All right. <laughs> totally ridiculous. But these were the forefathers that, that turned against Samuel. The offspring, they were offspring of Noah, remember. Everyone after the flood came from Noah and his family. So it wasn't some foreign race, some hybrid genetic, uh, you know, uh, Roswell, New Mexico crash, and they, you know, <laughs> breeded with the farmer there or something. I mean... Nothing like this. These were the, the, the 12 tribes. They were of the 12 tribes. They were taught. They rejected it. They rejected not only the teachings, but the teacher who was sent by Yahweh. And in doing so, they rejected Yahweh. And they started their own religion that has now taken over the world. But they're getting... Uh, Knocked back here a little bit. Little by little, we're chipping away at their mountain here because there's another mountain rising up that's never going to go down, never going to be knocked down, never going to diminish. It's going to continue to grow to cover the entire universe and turn all the universe away from the sins that are bringing the misery and death and destruction. Now, as Amos uh, 3 says... Can two walk together unless they are in agreement? Well, when Yahweh establishes His work, and then you go there, and it's already established and going, 
Is there really any logical place that you can think of, any room for you to come and argue and dispute? No, the only way you can be walking together with that established work is to be in agreement. Can two walk together unless they are in agreement? Believe me, Yahweh is, is hundreds of steps ahead of us at all times. All right, and he's leading and guiding us. We can't come here doubting, questioning, calling into question. Yes, you can ask questions. There's a big difference between asking a question for an information's sake and calling things into question. All right? It's a difference of night and day. It's a difference of being uh, wise and humble or being stupid and ignorant and rebellious. All right, now this righteous man uh, had uh, uh, fulfilled every prophecy written about him. All right, but the, he was rejected by his own, which was also another prophecy written about him. This prophecy shows that their carnal minds were blinded. That is to say, they were not inspired to see or understand the truth at that time. Uh, we were talking today and somebody, we were talking about the two trees in the garden and then uh, Yahweh says that a mist came up from the garden. And then I said, well, they, they probably missed the tree of righteousness, the tree of life. <laughs> they missed it. And so uh, they went after and started the mist tree religion <laughs> because they missed that tree. And they were blinded. They were in a mist. They were in a fog. Because they would not humble themselves and submit to the tree of life. All right, which is the only opportunity, the only way to get any understanding. All right, there's a few things you can gather, even from a King James Version, without a teacher. But for, to really, like the seventh day, which day is the Sabbath? Well, it plainly tells you the seventh day. There's not one scripture in there that says the first day is the Sabbath. Worship on the first day. All right? Just like there's no scripture that says, well, celebrate the birthday of the Savior. You can get a few things. There's no way you'll know how to keep the Sabbath. Well, what do you do on that Sabbath? Well, it says no work. So I better not get up out of bed. You know, better, better stop your heart and your breathing, too, because that's work also. <laughs> because they've stopped their brain. They obviously gave their brain the day off when they think like that. And so they should have kept that one thing engaged there. But now this prophesied work of the righteous man spoken of in Isaiah 41 to is first taught in Genesis and was prophesied for the time period called the last days. Notice Genesis 49, 1. Then Jacob called for his sons and said, Gather together so I may tell you what will befall you in the last days. Now he wasn't talking about the last days of their life. You know, he was giving a prophecy that, that for a time period thousands of years away. At, at the time he gave it. But he was speaking a prophecy. They probably scratched their heads and wondered, you know, uh, where did I put that donkey, you know, in the colt and ran out to tie it to a branch or something. You know, the mindset that some of them had. But notice the words last days. This is speaking of the 12 tribes. Yes, these were the 12 tribes because each son had sons and sons and sons and daughters, and on and on and on, and multiplied. Remember, as Abraham was told, they'll become many nations. Well, they did. They became many nations, and now they are in every nation on earth and ruling every nation on earth. But Yahweh multiplied them, and then he brought them out of, out of Egypt to fulfill his plan. Now, this is all in the bringing forth of that perfectly righteous man. And it was all in done 
uh, done in fulfillment to fulfill Genesis 1.26. You know, a lot of people read that and they thought, well, that was finished right there. You know, mankind, we're in the image and likeness of Yahweh. That occurred way back in Genesis 1. That's done. That's over with. We're beyond that. We have rulership over the earth and the land and the sea. And then they go out in nature and they get eaten by a bear or mauled by a tiger and and they show them how much rulership they actually have. (laughs) It's ridiculous. But anyways, uh, uh, he's talking about the uh, turning over of his entire creation to his family, to a family of beings who become in his image and likeness. If they would just look at that words, those words image and likeness, they would see he's talking about a perfect character. A perfect character like the one who was raised from the dead had without sin, without sin. Well, he did it all for them so they can have sin. You know why? Why on earth would that, how would that even be fair? If sin was okay, why couldn't he sin then? All right, that doesn't make any sense. And what it plainly tells us, he set us an example that we should follow, that we must, like him, we must become. Well, if it's okay to sin, how did he miss out? You know, this is the, re- the, the ridiculous mind of those who rejected the scriptures, who rejected the teacher who could explain these things and who did explain them in every era, but they rejected him. As uh, written in Yachadon, because they loved uh, the darkness rather than the light, because their deeds were evil and they didn't want to admit it, so they made it okay to sin. Oh yeah, only one guy uh, in history had to keep those laws. And, and he's our get out of jail free card, and we can all go do whatever we want. You know, <laughs> it doesn't, you know, it doesn't even make sense in any way. But in Yahweh's plan, it shows he had a breeding program, uh, of teaching righteousness and, and leading and guiding each, uh, uh, breeder. Righteous men and women can be brought forth in the image and likeness of the righteous heavenly father Yahweh. They will not bring harm to themselves or others as is done, excuse me, when sin is part of the lifestyle. Notice, sin brings harm. Now that harm, as we see in this article, may not be even noticeable with the naked eye. It says only 10% of the child defects can be seen with the naked eye. That leaves 90% of the active defects in the organs of man and animals that can't be seen until the symptoms worsen or they become physically or mentally ill and start doing crazy things like violence, hatred, fighting, military exercises in the Gulf, invasions of other nations, and other wars. All right, and that's, that's what sin brings. They want, Satan wants to make it desirable. But so she paints a picture of instant gratification and enjoyment. You can enjoy your life now. And 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 she leads you to believe that you would get more joy out of poisoning your body, filling it with diseases. Well, they're microorganisms. You can't see them. Why should they bother me? You know, but then they come back And they take over the body, and they take away your health, and they take away your life, and the lives of your children. And then hopefully right before the nuclear bomb, so you won't have to be burned up alive. Well, this is what occurs when Yahweh's laws are rejected. Okay, and Yahweh showed all of this to the 12 tribes when he brought them out of Egypt. He showed them all. He had Moshe show them the plan and show them the laws. As we read in in Leviticus 18, read that chapter again because that whole chapter deals with everything Satan is trying to get you to do now to kill yourself. All under the guise of enjoyment and pleasure. 
pleasure for a moment until it destroys your body. And these are the hinder gods that were, they were warned about. Okay? Have nothing to do with these hinder gods that you left behind. Come out from among them. All right? This is what he's telling us now in these last days, just like Moshe told the children of Israel when they were leaving Egypt. Come out. Let's get out of this place. Let's go to the house of Yahweh. Let's learn of his laws and stop sinning. That was the message. But sin is made to look desirable. That mystery, you know, is... Uh, and it's a mystery how anybody believes it and how they can trick you into accepting death. You're actually accepting death when you go that way. Now, this breeding program here brought Yahshua to perfection. All right, he brought him to where he would be a perfect man that would never, it was his own decisions, the breeding program made it possible here, and so that the only thing in his mind was the keeping of Yahweh's laws. He wasn't a robot. He had full uh, uh, power of choice in everything. But because of what was put in him, and it actually shows earlier, we had to skip over here about what, what occurs in the, in the womb, even, and, and how this first nine months in the womb can shape the rest of your life. Well, having the right parents, and Yahweh made that uh, uh, possible for Yahshua, and, and parents that would teach him, and parents in a bloodline that was kept free from defilement, so that he could have the power in his mind to choose only righteousness, so that he could be that perfect sacrifice for us, and show us that we too can turn away from all sin, in any form, reject it and grasp hold of life that he's offering. All right, and this was all done. And after proving or being proved to heaven and earth that he qualified, then to, to receive the scepter of righteousness, this righteous ruling, this guiding and teaching, as uh, the way Isaiah put it, was that, uh, you know, no more will their teachers be removed from them. In other words, there's always going to be a teacher at, at arm's length. You may, they may not see them, but they'll appear and say, no, this is the way, walk in it. All right? And then that's how we're going to keep the universe eventually here from being in a state of... Uh, 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 we're going to keep it in a state of total righteousness and total blessings by not allowing the sin through teaching. We're going to remind the person, hey, don't do that you're about to do. We're going to have that power to stop it before it actually starts. Amazing, huh? Really awesome, the, the life that, that, and, and the blessings. And pretty soon people will see of the true blessings and the benefits and the health and so on that come and the joy from doing this that they'll never again be fooled by this deceitfulness of sin. Now, this brings to attention the last day's work. This is Yahshua's last day's work, prophesied in Genesis 49. All right, remember, he's the one that was uh, worthy to receive the scepter of righteousness, but it didn't stop there. He didn't go on vacation somewhere. All right, he set it up for a work that took 2,000 years to lay the groundwork and prepare for the last two men that would be named by him who would do the work and call the last remnant of people together and turn them from their wickedness. All right? This is all the second phase of the work of this righteous man who was raised from the dead. These prophecies will show that there are two brothers who were named by Yahweh. As Zechariah 4.14 shows these are the two anointed ones who stand for the supreme ruler of the whole earth. Revelation 11 says, I will give power to my two witnesses. And then it describes them as the last two lamps. The last two lamps. So we know from there that the lamps are talking about works. And they're the last two. 
the two anointed ones, the olive trees, an olive branch, so forth, tying it in to all the prophecies regarding the branch, which, lo and behold, the branch is always tied to the vine. And as Yahshua said, I am the vine. In fact, in all the prophecies concerning that branch, Yahshua is always mentioned there, all right, as being that, that, that vine. Okay, and so it, it all flows together, like Pastor brought out this week, in one complete picture that Yahweh inspired many in his house to actually uh, uh, reproduce this picture, or produce this picture, the picture that Yahweh painted in the scriptures. They were inspired to bring these forth, and then, lo and behold, it matches perfectly to the clouds that were set up at certain time periods that depicted this very thing. You know, there's no way that that could have been planned or tried out and say, here, why don't you work on this, and uh, two years from now we're going to see it in the sky. <laughs> you know, and there's no way, no way. At the time that that was even started, uh, I don't, uh, well, maybe it was already. No, I don't think so. At the very first time that was started, I don't think it was even brought out yet about the donkeys being tied to the branch. You know, we knew about the olive branch, but we didn't know about the donkeys and the donkey cult being tied to that branch. So all of these things, these prophecies here, uh, that were 2,000 years later, 2,000 years after the Savior was resurrected and rose to be at the right hand of Yahweh, here comes another work. In the last days, I will reestablish my house. Who will believe our report? Isaiah said. Who would believe this report? Only a very few. Only a very few actually believe and obey and turn. Remember, three out of four fell away here from the house of Yahweh that were called in these last days alone. Three out of four. <laughs> and, and some have tried to say, well, that's the fault of the house of Yahweh because he didn't let them do what they wanted to do. In other words, we should have stopped turning them from their iniquity because they were committing sin. They didn't want to stop. They didn't want to admit to it, but they knew they were and they grew in bitterness just as Hebrews 3 and 4 show. That root of bitterness rose up and they did not enter into that rest. All right, and that's exactly, according to prophecy, what's taking place. Now, Yahweh gave his righteousness first to Abel in the great garden of Yahweh, the house of Yahweh. Keeping Yahweh's laws is righteousness, as we see in 1 Yachanan 3 and verse 7. Well, verse 4 says, Whoever commits sin transgresses also the laws, for sin is the transgression of the laws. And that is in every, every King James Bible, just like that even. Sin is the transgression of the laws. Then he says, Little children, let no man deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous. So it's not a only believe. There's a practice. Then in verse 8 he says, He who commits sin is of the devil. It can't get any plainer than that. All right, it can't get any plainer. Well, the bloodline of Yahshua was such because Yahweh's law in Deuteronomy 6 and verse 7 was kept by every generation that came along. In verse 7, you must teach them the laws, the statutes, and judgments which Yahweh your Father has commanded me to teach you, you must teach them diligently to your children and talk about them when you sit in your house and when you walk on the road. Not talk about worldly movies or worldly songs or stupid worldliness entertainment. That's not what he commanded here. If you were to do that and be a part of Yahshua's bloodline, Yahweh would have had to get you out of the way because you would have been putting defilement into that mind. Well, why do it now? Let's try with all of our might 
And let's do and become like Yahshua. And let's do the same for our children and don't let them be exposed to the world, to the entertainment of the world. Okay? Uh, you know, they don't need uh, the, any, uh, uh, any more strikes against them because our genes were already defiled somewhat and, and uh, the earth and the firmament is defiled that's why you can't even get a clean animal anywhere, a completely clean. We've got the cleanest of everything, but it's still nothing compared to what we're going to enjoy in Yahweh Shema. So why do any worse? All right, let's strive to get it all out, brethren, all out. Now, uh, this goes back to the days of Noah. In Genesis, we find that Yahweh... Well, let me go back here. The bloodline of the righteous man did live by and teach these laws to their children. They were so strong for Yahweh, they were willing to die at the hands of persecutors during the Crusades rather than break even one of Yahweh's righteous laws. Such breeding and devotion brought forth righteous genes and children easily trained in righteousness. Children easily trained in righteousness love and care for one another. The genes of children today are cluttered with mutated genes that have been altered by sinful lifestyles. Although mankind was created physically perfect and could breed offspring that were perfect, mankind became corrupt and defiled. And we see so much so that in the days of Noah, they had to be allowed to be wiped out. They were corrupt. Yahweh saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and every intent of the thoughts of man's heart was only evil continually. Well, it's gotten that way again, because Yahshua said, in the last days would be as the days of Noah. Well, this is what the days of Noah were like. He didn't mean technologically like the days of Noah, or that there would be an actual boat build. He said he wasn't going to do a flood again. So what was he talking about? He was talking about the growth of sin, the sin reaching its peak, and the corruption and defilement, and how things were actually worse now, the worst time of trouble. This isn't just, you know, uh, some old doomsday, what they would like to call a doomsday. Uh, you know, if they look around them, that, that's exactly what they're facing doom for the governments and the way of life for mankind, okay? But they want to say, oh, you're just being negative, you know, forget about all that stuff and enjoy life. <coughs> As they start coughing up blood and worms crawling out of their ears and everything else. You know, and we saw the films where they did the operations and had to get the worms out of the child's stomach and so on and the brains well, pretty soon they're just going to be crawling out of their ears and noses, you know, because they're multiplying like crazy and there's nothing in there to stop it. You know, so <laughs> go ahead and enjoy life, they say, and quit worrying about it. No, that's the death and defilement here that we're facing. And, and praise Yahweh for the plan of Yahweh who uh, raised up the, the righteous one brought him up to himself at his right hand and to where and set him to being the director and high priest over this great last day's work that is once again t telling the people, come out of this mess. Get out of this mess and come to Yahweh and I will be your father. Touch not this uncleanness. Touch it not. That means stay, you know, like he told Abraham, Get away from your father's house and from your kindred. Now, if they're called and they come here, that's one thing. But if not, leave them alone. They could cause you to lose your salvation and then be resurrected and get their salvation and say, well, where's so-and-so? Wasn't he at the house of Yahweh? Oh, yeah, but don't you remember he went with you at Christmas time last year, that year? And, and he lost his salvation. And they'll be like, oh, man. You know, that, so don't, don't fall for this. 
Don't fall for, you know, these traps of Satan. Don't turn away from that tree of life. All right, and don't fall for the, the scholars who guess their guesswork at what the prophecies mean. They can't understand it because they're not sent, they're not spoken of in prophecy, and the seals that were opened weren't given to them. Remember, Daniel said none of the wicked would understand. Well, who would understand? Zechariah 4 tells you in 5, who has understanding and takes that understanding to the whole world. It's the two servants who are the anointed ones who stand for the Father in the earth. The one sent, the man whose name is the branch. Here, that's it. That's, that's where you get the understanding. Well, may Yahweh bless your understanding. And uh, next week, don't forget to bring your uh, Did Yahshua Messiah pre-exist books. Very, very informative, fascinating uh, history that we're going to go into here. Of, of what they did in, in removing Yahweh's name and His laws from the minds of the people and how crafty Satan was at doing so. All right, may Yahweh bless your understanding and let's go ahead with closing prayer. Almighty and righteous Heavenly Father Yahweh, once again this is Kohan Shaul along with all the great Kohans, the great deacons, and the great men and young men and future priests of your house, Father, all of us being the seed and servant of your witness Israel in these last days as we come to you through Yahshua Messiah, our great high priest and king, the man that you rose from the dead, Father, who is leading and guiding and directing this work at this time. And Father, we are so thankful for your plan and for uh, including us in it, Father, and calling us out of this sin-sick world and giving us an opportunity to be a part of the solution, the peaceful solution to the curses of sin, that we would turn many, Father, through the, the repeating the teachings that we're being taught, that we would turn many to righteousness, indeed this whole universe soon, Father, to righteousness, to uh, bring forth the great blessings and abundant living for everyone, Father, that you have created and, and continue as the, we know the universe is expanding. Father, we pray for your servant Israel that you watch over and protect him, Father, and continue to lead and guide him and, and expand his boundaries and grant him the means to get this message out and help us, Father, to be humble, fit, and suitable workers in assisting this to truly be the vessels of silver and gold and not of wood and clay that we know are going to be destroyed and removed from your house. And Father, we pray for the great Kohan Yadidia that you release him soon. And we pray that you heal the sick and afflicted and be with us throughout this week and bring us once again to another Sabbath day of rest in, in joy and praise and thanksgiving. And we do, Father, give you all thanksgiving and praise through our high priest, Yahshua. Hallelujah. Yahweh.